Good morning. Welcome one and all, especially if you're a visitor. It's great that you could be with us. Please know you're always welcome. And if you'd like to leave a record of your visit on the inside cover of the service folder, you can write your information, and there's a basket on the back table. In our service today, as usual, we're not talking about anything new. And in fact, we're talking about a topic that we probably talk about every quarter, and that topic is faith. We talk about it because we know the struggles we have, but we also talk about it because we know what our Savior has done and will continue to do to keep us in the faith and keep us on that road to heaven. May God bless our time gathered around his word. Our entire service is in the service folder and up on the screen. We begin as we meet with God. We gather to worship our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God we can trust at all times and in all things. Amen. Our opening hymn. confess our sins. Fellow believers, when you get in the car to go to work or school in the morning, do you doubt the car will make it all the way to your destination? Likely not. Yet cars break down and cause headaches all the time. We don't doubt that our vehicle will do what we want, even though time and time again we've been let down. But we do doubt God, the one who has been and will be faithful to every single promise he has ever made. This lack of faith is not a small problem. It's a result of us being sinfully imperfect people. So let us come to him humbly and confess our sins. We join together. O oh Lord, I have every reason to trust you. I have no reason to doubt anything you have said or any promises you have made. But at times, I do just that. Forgive me for my far from perfect faith. Forgive me for doubting your word. Forgive me for giving in to faithless worry. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. Fellow believers, as members of God's family, we too often doubt and lack trust. But our failure to always have faith does not change the promises of our God. Despite our weaknesses, he remains faithful, and he always will. So hear these blessed words from your faithful loving Savior God. All your sins are forgiven. This is a gift from your triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you. 
Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us the, those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Have faith. It's so easy to say, so easy to agree with, so hard to do in all circumstances. But the call to have faith has power. Why? It comes from our Lord himself, who has, time and again, proven himself trustworthy. As you hear our lessons, notice the calls to have faith and rejoice over the one who stands behind those calls, our gracious, loving, faithful Lord. 1 Kings 19, beginning at 9. The word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat from Abel-Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet... I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. This is our first lesson. Our second lesson from James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. This is the word of the Lord. We join together in our verse of the day from Hebrews 11. Alleluia, alleluia. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our lesson, which will also serve as the basis for our message, is from Matthew chapter 14. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. 
Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time, our young worshipers are invited forward for the children's message. Nice and eager, I like that. Okay, let's nail this. Good morning. Good morning. Nice work. I want to tell you guys about a very interesting creature. It only comes out three to maybe four months of the year. It usually shows up early August, and it smells terrible. Like one of the worst things you can ever smell. Anyone know what it is? What's that? Raccoon? That's a good guess. That's not what I'm thinking. It's a high school football player. <laughs> they are so absolutely disgusting. At practice, sometimes I'll put my hands on their shoulders to tell them what to do, and I'll be sitting at my desk two hours later going, and then I have to go scrub down. They're absolutely the foulest things on the face of this earth. So what do they need? It's the same thing you guys need when you're playing outside on a hot day and you're super sweaty. What do you need? Water to drink, yes, but you also need water for something else. Cleaning, yeah. You need a shower, you need a bath. Because you're stinky, you're smelly, you're sweaty, you're dirty. Got to get rid of that. Well, that's a good thing. Don't neglect proper hygiene. But there's an even better kind of washing that I think every one of us here has had. And it happened at something just like that. What was it? Baptism. Now, when we do a baptism, do we put the baby in and scrub away and get all the dirt off it so it doesn't smell sweaty or weird? No. Because in baptism, God's not worried about dirt on our skin. He's worried about sin. But when you take a shower and you come out, you're clean, right? Same thing in baptism. But instead of our skin being clean, it's our hearts. They're washed away. So, bathe and shower regularly. I have to tell high schoolers this, too. But maybe the next time, whether it's washing your hands or taking a shower or a bath, stop and say, thank you, Jesus, 
for taking away more than dirt. You took my sin away. Let's say a prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for washing us. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Help us to always live as your children. Amen. Thank you. May we return to your seats. We continue with the hymn of the day. I know you all love these word guessing games, so sure, we'll do it again. You get one word, and I want you to think, what word is the opposite of faith? And you can't use like unbelief or something, that's too obvious. And you have a clue up there. What word is the opposite of faith? If I had to pick one word, the word would be fear. Let's say the main breadwinner in your family loses his or her job. What does fear say? This is horrible, this is terrible, how are we ever going to make it? What does faith say? God's in control, somehow, some way, he will provide. Faith and fear are on total opposite ends of the spectrum. They couldn't be more different. So the next question is this. If our, we had a faith gauge in our heart, and on this side, like a gas gauge in a car, at this side it's faith, and this side it's fear, to which one does the needle more often point or least trend? I know especially today, sitting in church, you think, nah, not perfect. But that faith needle, that needle is closer to faith than it is to fear. And I'm hoping that is the case. I thank God that is the case. We all know there's plenty of times when whew, it goes to fear and goes there almost immediately. I'm not going to list a bunch of circumstances because you know them in your personal life. You've been there. We all have. In fact, every Christian in the history of the world has struggled with faith versus fear, and too often fear wins out. And not just every Christian struggled with that. Even Jesus' appointed disciples do as well. The context here, it's important to note. Prior to this, Jesus had fed 5,000, and that was men, so including women and children, let's go 10, 12, 15,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. So the disciples clearly saw that Jesus just kept breaking bread, just kept passing out fish, 
And, and it kept coming. It was one more reminder for them that he was who he said he was, the almighty, all-powerful Son of God. So this is done. Jesus wants some time to commune with his Heavenly Father in prayer. So he sends the disciples out, cross the lake, I'll meet you over there. So they hop in the boat, they start, and it was not a happy occasion. It seems like pretty quickly the weather headed south and in a really nasty way. Even today, because of pressure changes and all this other stuff I don't understand, furious storms can arise on this lake like, like nothing. And we also know it's bad, not just because of the description in our lesson, but a number of the disciples were experienced fishermen. They had probably seen everything this lake could throw at them. And even these guys were so terrified that they figured they were going to die, and at best their family was going to bury a memory. If we had a gauge on them and could see where it was at this moment in our lesson, would it be faith or would it be over toward fear? I think you know the answer. And while we want to sit here and say, shame on those guys, haven't we been there all too often? Again, here, needles over this way. We're doing good, we're feeling good. But then that crisis, fill in the blank, whatever it is, it's, and almost immediately we go to fear. We start envisioning the worst. We start feeling sorry for ourselves. We start setting out chairs for the pity party because, oh, this is so horrible and it's never, ever going to get better. That's the disciples. That's us. In them, we see ourselves. So they're on the lake, freaking out, nervous, worried. And of course, Jesus had a handle on things. So he starts walking to them on the water. And what do they say? It's a ghost. Every time I read about the disciples doing this, a part of me wants to hop into a time machine, go back, and just whack, just right across the face and say, are, are you kidding me? You just saw him multiply bread and fish for thousands of people. You know his power, and now you think he's walking on, it's a ghost instead of him on the water? But even just saying that now, and I've said it practicing this 30 times, I still feel like a total hypocrite. Because don't I have the same reason to trust Jesus? Has he not promised, made promises to me as he did to them? Do I sometimes forget that and think something foolish? Maybe not that he's a ghost, but like that he won't be there? Do we look at Jesus and see him as he is, as he should be seen, or do we see him through the eyes of fear as the disciples did? Well, Jesus knows they're terrified, they're afraid. So what does he say to them? He says, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Real quick football reference. So we practice with the JV guys over two fields, pretty big area, and when there is a long, protracted whistle, like, mm, like that long. That's the head coach. And when people hear that whistle, players, coaches, everybody, they should instantly drop everything and turn toward him saying, what do you want? Jesus saying, it is I, take courage, don't be afraid. That was the whistle. That should have had them stop worrying about the wind, the waves, all that other stuff, and they should have placed every bit of their focus on him. But they didn't. They freaked out, their mind went to dark places, it's a ghost, and the woe is me party continued. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because you know you've been there. You know the promises of God's word. You're going through an issue sometimes, and this happens, I can't tell you how many times people say it. They're like, were you in my house? Because you were talking about exactly something our family was struggling with. We clearly know, we hear the promises of God, but then fear wins out and we start thinking crazy things like he's not there, he doesn't care, he doesn't love us, and whoosh, further down the needle goes. So all this is happening, and take a wild guess who speaks. Of course, it's Peter. And he says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to walk to you on the water. Now, humanly speaking, this makes sense. He wanted some proof. There's a storm. I'm a human. Humans sink. Give me some reason to trust. Tell me it's you, Jesus. Let me walk on the water. And the world says, well, that, that's fine. He needed some proof. But that's not how faith works. That's how fear works. Fear demands proof. Fear demands, I need to see before I act. I want it all laid out. I don't want to take one step of faith. And we've all been there too. We know the promises in God's word to be with us through a trial. But how many times have we thought, Lord, if you just give me a sign, or if you just let this happen, then I'll trust you. Then I'll believe. That's not faith. 
That's fear. But of course, Jesus being loving and gracious, he doesn't say, all right, Peter, you moron, sit down. He says, you know what? Come to me. Peter steps out of the boat, and for a while, he's walking. Good job, Peter. But you heard what happens next. He takes his eyes off Jesus, looks at all the other bad stuff, down he goes. Faith meter almost all the way over to fear. And we don't want to sit on our high horses and look down at him because we've all been there. It's that phone call, it's that text, it's that split second thing that happens. And almost immediately we go from feeling like we're strong to wondering if we even have faith at all. Jesus had every right to rip into Peter. Say, after everything you've seen, after everything I've told you, still you're doubting me? Still you're not looking to me? You're worried about all this other stuff? But he doesn't do that. Instead, because of his grace and love, he knows Peter is struggling. So what does he do? He reaches down and he picks him up. He saves him. By putting him in the boat? Yes. But this was only a preview of some greater saving that Jesus would do. For all Peter's sins, for his lack of trust, for his failure, for his his spiritual idiocy, Jesus went to that cross. Because Peter needed a lot more than being saved from drowning, he needed his soul saved. And the only way that could happen would be for Jesus going to that cross to pay for his sins. And we know we keep flipping back and forth, the same thing's true for us. We all have trials that we face, and so easily we think, this is the storm. This is the huge one. It's not. Because the biggest storm's already been taken care of. Our biggest fear should be that God wants no part of us because of our sin. Our biggest fear should be we are all alone, completely adrift in life's sea. But we know that's not the case because as our Savior reached down and picked up Peter, he's done the same for us. That's what the cross is all about. We were drowning in our sins with absolutely no hope, and yet he said, I will save you. And how did he save us? By letting himself be drowned. By going to the depths of that sea and placing us in the boat. Now, I know that's a different way of saying it, but that's nothing new. You hear that every time you're here. And thank God, because that reality means we can trust every other promise he's made as well. Jesus has promised that no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, he is always there for us, always working all things for our good, always covering us with his forgiving love. Now, we are still sinners. We see this stuff. We still get freaked out. We still get scared. Still, the needle drops down. But it doesn't have to. What we need to do at those times is the exact opposite of what Peter did. We need to, in faith, look to our Savior and say, I trust you. I trusted you with my salvation at the cross. I trust you now through this moment. I know your grace and love. I know you will work all things for my good. At the end of our lesson, Jesus puts Peter in the boat, and you heard what happened. The wind and the waves, everything goes calm. And I'm sure the disciples thanked Jesus for that immediate answer to the hardship they were going through. Now, we may have times when we see the immediate answer to our problem. Doctor says this looks bad. They do another test, another scan. Suddenly it's gone. Sometimes God delivers in that way. But even if he doesn't deliver in that way, even if it's still the worst possible news from the doctor, nothing has changed. The Lord is still holding our hand. He is still working all things for our good. He is still stopping us from drowning. And he will spiritually keep on lifting us into that boat until we reach the glorious shores of heaven. Now, maybe right now, some of you, but the numbers, it has to be some of you, are going through some pretty heavy things right now. The storm in your life is getting pretty bad, and it's taking a toll on your faith life. If that's you, I hope you can see the comfort this lesson brings. But if right now things are going pretty well in your life, maybe file this one away. Because you know as well as I do the way life works, it could be only a couple hours from now. And suddenly you're out on that water and it's getting up to your knees. So whether it's remembering it now in the good times or recalling it during the dark times, we have to do what Peter didn't do at first, keep the focus on Jesus. Remember his work on the cross and by God's grace have faith in him and his promises. And when he sees us through yet another problem, let us say along with the disciples, truly you are the Son of God. May God grant us such a faith always. Amen. We sing the final verse of our hymn.
us to use the tools you've given us, your word and supper, to fight fear when it arises in our imperfect hearts. Remind us that you are in charge of all things and that you've promised to work all things, even trials, for our good. Instead, lead us to trust you, especially as we remember the love you showed and the promises you fulfilled when you sent your Son as our Savior. Renew us each day with your Spirit, that we may walk, talk, and live as the confident believers you have made us. We ask you to be with those who are struggling, whether it's physically, emotionally, or spiritually. In all things, bring them healing, health, and above all, hope that in all things you, things you are working for their good. Be with those in the congregation who celebrate a birthday this week, and be with those couples that celebrate a wedding anniversary. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Hear us as we join to pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Thanks and praise to you, O Father, who sent your only Son into the world to be a man, to be born of a woman, and to die for us on a cross. Your Son Jesus walked among us on our earth, in our world of conflict. And he invites us to remember that his death and resurrection gives us life and peace. Now we wait for him until he comes again in glory. In this sacrament, we remember the death of our Lord Jesus. We receive his gifts of forgiveness and salvation. We live by his presence. We wait for his coming again. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, This is the blood of the covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Come to the Lord's altar, all things are now ready. Blessing the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We close with our final verse. <laughs> 